So my name is Jeremy Colmel, and today I'm going to be talking about Hello, so my name is Jeremy Colmel, and today we're going to be talking about FluoroMatch Flow, which is an all-in-one solution, which we talked a little bit about in the first tutorial in the introduction. So I recommend you watch that one first, tutorial one. Now, in this tutorial, first, as shown up before, you download FluoroMatch, and you'll get a zip file. Now we recommend you extract that zip file in your C drive. So if you go over here, you can go to this PC, C drive, and extract it over here. Or once you extract it, yeah, no, extract it over here. Because if you extract it somewhere else, often files will be removed and you could get some errors. So that's the first step. You got to want it close to your root directory. Once you extract it, so this it should look something like this you'll get this .bat file, floromatch underscore flow .bat, and that's going to be your software. And so here you can see, you know, you can go back if you want to um, look back at any updates. Uh, you can go back to the website and make sure that you're using the latest version, uh, which will be updated here. You can also ask for help, uh, watch the YouTube tutorials, and then also see the supporting institutions and their websites here. Now, generally, as we talked about in tutorial one, you want a couple different file types. So first you want your data dependence, um, MSMS files. Those could be using iterative exclusion or just data dependent analysis. Uh, we have some good papers that discuss the advantages of iterative exclusion here. Or even targeted MSMS files. But the point is these are ion selected MSMS files. We are working and probably at this point have developed for Agilent at least a way to convert MS to the E files as well as QRay data so kind of swath type all ions data uh, and other types of all ions data into uh, deconvolute and turn it into an MSMS file. So there are ways that you can use those data as well. Uh, so you can look into that. But generally uh, targeted MSMS data dependent, iterative exclusion data dependent, all those files can go in here. And those can be as many files as you want. Obviously, it'll take more time. The more files you have, and actually increase false positives. So if you have representative AFFFs, there's no reason, even if you ran a number of samples, to run a ton of data dependent. But if you're running very different contaminated soil samples from different areas, you might want to have data dependent for all of them. Now, negative mode. Uh, we can look at an example. So here's um, some Agilent data. There's the 3M light water uh, from um, McDonough's lab, Kerry McDonough. And this is a triple F solutions. And then there's one that was treated with enzymes, so it has um, metabolized. And you'll see target in the name. So if you have like 100 samples, I don't re recommend that we do untargeted peak detection on all of that because it will cause the computer to potentially crash and it'll take a very long time. And so we do a first stage of targeted peak detection or untargeted peak detection just for things that have targets in the name. So if you have 1,000 samples, take those that have the most PFAS in them, put target in their name. I recommend between 10 and 15 if you have that or as many samples as you have under that to have target in the name, and the rest don't put target. These will be treated as normal samples, too, in your table for statistics, etc. So in this case, we only had eight samples, so we put target in every single name. Now, we want to put those in the negative mode. Also, very important to have blanks. Blank samples will be used automatically to filter your data so that nothing from your blank is included. Now note, currently the tooltip is slightly wrong here, but A represents the percentile, so one would be the maximum of your samples, zero would be the minimum of your samples that have to be greater than the blank threshold, which we'll talk about. Uh, so if we put 0.5, for example, it would be the median of your samples. Often I keep this at default, so one would be the maximum of your samples, uh, only considering those reference target samples. And then 
C, we usually leave at 3, and this would be similar to the L of D. So this is the average of your blanks for that feature that we're comparing to. So it does it for each feature, plus 3 times the standard deviation. So that makes sense. Leave that at 3. And then how many orders of magnitude do you want to be above this L of D? So 5 to 10 for a limit of quantitation. Usually because we have relatively high background PFAS levels, I'll keep this level at 2. So just 2 times the limit of detection. If you're missing data, this could be one place where it gets filtered out if you have high background noise. Um, so usually leaving these um, same or just changing A. Now, if you don't have blank files, they're highly recommended, and we don't recommend you run without blank files, and so we'll drag them in here, uh, then you can unclick this checkbox, and it will still be able to run without blank files. Again, not recommended, but if you have old data and you don't have good representative blanks for that run with the same retention times, that's a possibility so that you can still analyze that data. Now, sometimes people acquire their data-dependent data and their full scan data at the same time. In that case, just copy your files over and rename them. So you'll have two instances. Take a little more room on your hard drive, but that's how the software works. So now we'll take our data-dependent files, and you can drag them over here. And you'll want whatever MSMS files. And those are all the files you'll need. Then you take a directory for exporting your results. Um, usually, again, close to the root directory is good. Uh, so let's make up a folder. whatever you want to call it. Um, usually I use the date, etc. You want to name things correctly so that you can remember them later. And then project name. As you scroll over here, I'll say keep to a minimum length. Again, uh, these directories can get quite long. It's producing a lot of files organized in a lot of folders. So just li li limit your characters on file names, etc. so that you don't have any problems with having too long a directory, which Windows can't handle. So in this case, I'm just going to call this 3M. Um, it doesn't really matter, it just gets appended to some of the file names. So you could click Start Now, and it would run. There are some new options in this new version of Flora Match that I think are very important to consider. So there's a statistics that will be integrated into the visualizer. It is integrated if you run it. So you can see here that I named my files underscore DDMS2 underscore for data dependent. Uh, I put underscore neg at the end of everything. You want to do that. And blank and blank file names and target in the reference sample names. So that's the kind of naming conventions you want to use. Additionally, you want to put what groups they're in. Uh, you know, maybe in the beginning of your file name, it doesn't matter, but they have to be unique. And all samples you want in that group should have that character string. So in this case, and not all samples have to have a group. So in this case, we're going to look at our negative mode data for grouping. We have 3M lightweight, so 3MLW. So that's what I used for the character string. So when you're running your instrument, you want to name the files accordingly, or you can rename them. And then MET for metabolized. Again, you want these file names to be very short. And so now, if you want to do statistics and have that automated for you as well, when you click um, go, you can see that there's some example files here. So these are for the groupings. And so what we'd want to do here is we'd want to change this to 3MLW and change this one over here to MET. It can take more than three groupings or two groupings. So you can put, I think, up to 10 groupings here and the software will work. So pretend we renamed this. I'm um, running something in the background, so I'm not going to rename them. Then you would drag your grouping names here. One more interesting feature over here is this targeted peak detection. Now, part targeted peak detection is pretty helpful. So if you go over here, let's say you have some known compounds, and you're like, OK, I know I saw these when I was running my data. I know that they that these PFAS come out at 7.03, 6.84, so on and so forth. And I want to make sure that I target these compounds. 
Also, if you run internal standards, let's say you're normalizing your PFAS to labeled standards, then you could put the masses here, the retention times here as well, just to ensure that the things that you know you want to get in your data set are, are obtained. So you can do a targeted workflow, so to say, here uh, to make sure that these analytes are p-picked. And then you would drag that targeted, here we only support negative mode again in the PFAS so far, um, you would drag it in here. Now there's a few other parameters you might want to change. Um, there is the MSMS intensity threshold for file conversion. If you scroll over, you, there's some explanation of each of these. Um, but briefly, this is very useful in the sense that Let's say I don't want to look at anything under 1,000 for Thermo or maybe 30 for Agilent or 100 for Agilent, depending on how um, where your noise level is. So if my noise level, if I know I don't care about MSMS peaks below 100, they're not really relevant to me, then I can put 100 here. It will reduce this file size when it's converted automatically when we click Start and speed up all the processes thereafter and reduce the space on storage. So that can be very useful. Similarly, this third parameter is for full scan when it's converting these to .mzxml. And again, we can say, okay, I don't, uh, below 1e to the 3, I don't need any scans below that. Remember, this is not peak height. This is going to be all scans, so the peak bottom to the peak top. Um, so maybe we do 100 again. Um, depends on where your noise level is. So pretty much this is the noise level to reduce file size. Another way you can reduce file size is changing the min and max in seconds. So let's say your void volume is at one minute. You don't want to look at anything below that. So here you could put 60 as your min. And maybe you know there's an equilibration time that you acquired that you don't care about uh, after 10 minutes. So you could put 600 here. Um, and that way it will cut your files down. Again, uh, increase the speed of analysis and decrease the file size on disk. Uh, less likely to crash too. So this second parameter here is just for annotation. So maybe I want to see everything above 100 intensity, but I don't really want it to be used to confirm confident annotations. You know, if it has something at 200, I'm not going to consider that very strong evidence. So you could have this as an increased value compared to your conversion because uh, this is just for the identification. You'll still be able to see those MSMS peaks. They'll still be converted. Um, it just won't use them for annotation. These are tolerances for uh, searching. Uh, MS1 is in Dalton's. MS2 is in PPM. So maybe plus or minus 0 0.005. Um, this is a window, so this would be plus or minus 5 PPM. Then you click, click Start. When you start, it automatically saves these parameters. So next time you run the software, uh, it'll have these parameters here, and you can change them. You can also save or load parameters, um, but kind of unnecessary in the sense that it's just going to use whatever default you used last time if you click Start. Once you click Start, there's some important things to cover here, which is these loading bars. So at first, when it's doing data conversion and feature processing, you'll see a bunch of steps over here. Um, that will spit out. If you do have any troubles, copy and paste all of this uh, and email it with your issues. Uh, first, look at the troubleshooting document, which is uh, troubleshooting common issues here. Uh, and also look at the instructions in the video tutorials. Make sure you have it right. And then contact us if you still have trouble. So this loading bar actually moves pretty quickly in the beginning, and then it uh, slows down a lot around here. So don't worry about that. That's normal. Um, it's going to take quite a long time to, to finish. Uh, can take hours. If you have very, very large data sets, and depending on your RAM and computer power, it could take days. Uh, so, you know, if you had 50 data files, I consider that a large data set. It's going to take some time. We've worked with 300 data files before. Uh, after that, you're kind of pushing it. You do want very high RAM to be able to process these, unless you're using the modular, really, for the peak picking side. So we have terabyte systems. 64 gigabyte, 32 gigabytes, fine for small data sets like this. But once you get it to large data sets, you want hundreds of gigabytes to terabyte RAM. Then the annotation will go, and then the EIC MS1 Spectre. And once all of these are green, then you know you're good to go. 